Welcome, and thank you all for joining us for this episode of the Crexie Podcast, an insider's look at all things commercial real estate. In this show, we cover a broad range of topics that cater to newcomers of CRE and industry leaders alike. I'm your host, Ashley Kobovich, Regional Director at Crexie. And today, we are thrilled to sit down with Ron Cohen, Chief Chief Sales Officer at Besson Partners. Before we dive in, a little bit about our guest. Ron runs the investment sales brokerage at Besson Partners and is responsible for revenue, business development, and talent management. He joined Besson Partners in 2003 as an investment sales associate and has brokered sales transactions in Manhattan, Brooklyn, and the Bronx. In 2008, Ron added the role of chief marketing officer and was also charged with working with the sales team to grow the number of exclusive assignments. In 2016, he was appointed Chief Sales Officer to fully focus on growing revenue and leading the sales team. He holds a broker's license in New York, New Jersey, and Connecticut. Before entering commercial real estate, Ron spent a decade as an account management professional in advertising. As Vice President slash the Group Account Director at DeMarcy, Macius, Benton, and Bowles, DMBNB, he partnered closely with Fortune 100 clients such as Procter & Gamble, Kraft Foods, and Philips Electronics to develop marketing strategies and implement multi-million dollar ad campaigns for well-known consumer brands such as Crest and Norelco. Ron is an active member of the New York real estate community and has held various leadership roles. He is a member of Israel Bonds Real Estate Division and is a former chairman of the Young Mortgage Bankers Association. YMBA. In addition to participating on the St. Jude Spirit of Hope Committee, Ron supports charitable causes including the Food Bank of New York, UNICEF, and Covenant House. He is a native New Yorker who graduated from the State University of New York at Oneonta and holds an MBA in marketing slash international business from Fordham University Gabelli Graduate School of Business. Ron, welcome to the podcast. Thank you so much. Pleasure we are to be here. so, so excited to have you here. I know our listeners want us to dive in. So I know we just covered a extensive background about you, but we'd like to hear it from you yourself. So give us a little bit of how you got started into your career path, some lessons you learned along the way. So what drew you to your current focus? Sure. Uh, thank you for having me. Pleasure to be here. And, um, you know, as, as you indicated, uh, commercial real estate is really a second career for me. I had uh, started out in the advertising agency business, I guess aspiring to be uh, another modern day Don Draper. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I was passionate about the business, certainly, and uh, spent uh, almost 10 years doing television commercials for big brands like Crest, Norelco, Post Cereals, mm-hmm. and, uh, and what have you. And um, really, just as a native New Yorker, uh, reading the Sunday real estate section of the New York Times every every Sunday, uh, and oogling over you know buildings and architecture, walking around New York City, uh, I became enamored with real estate, and uh, decided that I had to get in the game and I wanted to sell buildings. So I, I made the pivot. I love to hear that. So it just took a little bit of reading the newspaper and it enticed you enough to come. And the real estate industry is lucky to have you. So from your early days or in commercial real estate, who were some of your mentors or industry folks that you admire? And then how did they shape your career path? Sure. Well, um, certainly having having mentors and, uh, you know, people people to help you and coach you along the way is uh, is critical in Mm -hmm. in real estate and and in any career. Um, I have uh, had the pleasure of working with Michael Besson uh, for 20 years now who is the chairman and CEO of, of our company, Besson Partners. And I've certainly really learned the business from him as a mentor, uh, where he's really taught me about brokerage, uh, negotiating strategy, and just being entrepreneurial mm-hmm. overall. Um, he is tough but fair, <laughs> and uh, I've certainly learned a lot from him. Um, there's, there's, there's a lot of terrific folks in, in our business. Uh, I did a short stint at what was Eastern Consolidated uh, in 2008. 
um, where I had uh, the pleasure of working on a team with with Eric Anton, mm. who is uh, still in the business to this day, yeah. and uh, he is just a top notch broker and uh, and, a, and a terrific guy. So uh, c- certainly someone whom I respect and admire, uh, even even despite the fact that he's he's at a competitor. <laughs> um, you know, speaking of Eastern Consolidated, which um, you know which is no longer in existence. Uh, the, uh, the the founder and CEO of, of that brokerage uh, is is the late Peter Hausberg, who uh, was was a wonderful leader and uh, really created a terrific breeding ground for a lot of top talent that uh, remains active in in the business today. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, a couple others. Uh, I think anyone in middle market investment sales, you gotta you gotta give props to to Bob Knackle. Uh, you know the the guy's accomplishments, his knowledge base, his experience, and his passion for the business are inspiring to us all. Uh, and um, and I've I've worked with some some wonderful women in in the business as well. Um, certainly worth worth noting. Uh, early on in the business, I worked with Adelaide Pulsinelli, mm-hmm. uh, who's still going in, um, as well as. Uh, Deborah Lee Sheraton has uh, has been a client, and she was really a pioneer, one of the really first women in commercial real estate mm-hmm. brokerage, uh, as well as Dawn Paris, who was uh, uh, married to Peter Hausberg and led Eastern Consolidated. So um, I certainly hope to uh, have a positive impact on people coming into the business like these folks have had on me. I love that, Ron. Those are some impressive names. Um, Eric, I definitely barged into his office a couple times trying to sell him Crexy. (laughs) I had a couple drinks across the street. Come on, Eric. Uh, Yeah, go on, Eric. Uh, Bye, Crexy. Um, But no, they're they're a great, great group of folks over at the Anton Group. Um, Bob Knackle, obviously, huge leader, wonderful mentor, close and far away for a lot of people in the commercial real estate industry. I love how you speak about the women in commercial real estate as well. Definitely sales is a male dominated industry plus commercial real estate. So folks like Adelaide, um, I think she's called the queen of skyscrapers or something like that. That, um, that, is, so. Dar- that is Darcy Stakem to, to oh, give Darcy. credit where credit is due. Who, is, <laughs> who we also who need is, to get on the podcast who as is, well. Who is re- um, a force to be reckoned with. Absolutely. Yeah. So I, I love that all of these people have, have led to your success, which has been so great. Um, would you mm-hmm. tell our listeners a little bit about some lessons that you learned early on, whether that was from your own experience or working with Michael or any of the folks that you just mentioned? What were some of the the lessons that you learned early on that became invaluable to you moving forward? Sure. Uh, you know, one one lesson I, I learned is that y- you can't always take what your client seller uh, tells you at face value. Um, not to sound cynical or distrustful. But oftentimes, uh, you know, your your seller uh, may paint a rosier picture than <laughs> what is actuality in terms of what what is happening with the property, or you know, sure. or or the numbers there. So, said another way, um, do your homework, mm-hmm. check the numbers, mm-hmm. underwrite conservatively, uh, so you don't get burned down the line. Okay. Uh, you know, really an- good point. Yeah, I mean, uh, another thing I would say is just in terms of clients and client communication, which is really, in my mind, at the at the focus center of what we do. Uh, you know, sometimes you need to tell clients what they want to hear, mm-hmm. and sometimes you need to tell clients what they need to hear, mm-hmm. and it's typically in that order. <laughs> I like that. I like both of those points, right? Um, especially on the sellers, a lot. A lot of people have said, you know, and a, a lot of sellers, if they're owning something, it's like their child, right? You know, and um, parents when sometimes they have a baby and they're like, oh, it's so cute, and they come out looking like a little alien, right? And you're like, oh, it's not that cute, <laughs> right? But we're gonna tell them what they want to hear. Congratulations, all children, all children, all children are, are, are cute, right? right? Yes. Um, but you know, then we tell them what, what what they need to hear, which is you know the facts and being honest and I think being transparent is really where you know the the good brokers become great right you know you want to appease the client but then also be truthful about what what you can do and cannot do with the property and Mm -hmm. things like that so absolutely really really great lessons for our, our listeners here 
Now, do you have any favorite mistakes, Ron, um, or moments that course corrected you onto your current path that maybe at the time you didn't recognize was an opportunity? Favorite mistakes. So um, <laughs> I'm actually going to go back in time on that <laughs> one, uh, way before my, you know, my, my, my career days, uh, back to college uh, when I was hustling to, you know, make make some money to, to, to live and working in, in various restaurants. Mm -hmm. So um, I had worked in this one restaurant owned by, uh, by a Greek guy. And anyone who's in New York City well knows that, uh, that, that Greek folks uh, own and operate a lot, of, a lot of restaurants here, and they know what the heck they're doing. Um, so uh, there were multiple times where I, where I got yelled at for um, refilling the Parmesan cheese container right by the ice making machine which at the time didn't seem like anything to me, just a minor detail, I, I kind of shrugged it off. Um, but in, in retrospect, uh, I, 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 I came to understand that uh, this guy knew his business and uh, there was a method to his madness and, you know, and a reason for everything. And the reason he was so successful is because he had his eye on every detail down mm. to something that small. So uh, that was a big lesson learned for me that, you know, that details really matter. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's just something I took with me, like, to, to this day. I, I still hear the guy's voice in, in, in my head <laughs> uh, about the cheese over the ice. Um, now, uh, you know, things have come full circle because I have Greek building owners yelling at me uh, <laughs> when, I, when I cold call them in, you know, in Astoria, Queens. So uh, anyway, uh, all, all respect to, to, to the Greek folks in New York. Um, I've learned a lot from them. I love that. <laughs> I love that you took us back to those days. I think that working in a service industry, working in a restaurant, I did it, you know, when I was in college and a little bit of summers in between. And it is such an amazing place to learn those kind of skills, people skills, how to interact, how to make sure that your attention to detail is there. Um, so I love to hear that. And I'm sure our listeners do as well. Do you have any daily habits or practices that have become essential to your career? So whether that's commercial real estate focused or otherwise like meditation or working out or things like that, <clears throat> give us a little insight to your day to day. Yeah, sure. Meditation, working out. I mean, a lot of us do that, right? Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, uh, I'm feeling a Matthew McConaughey <laughs> day one moment coming here. No, just kidding. Just kidding. Uh, yeah, you know, there's there's one little fun ritual that uh, that 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 I've implemented at, at our office, um, which 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 we call the daily wake up song. Mm. So, you know, listen, we're in sales, we you know, we, we get a lot of rejection and, you know, and, and motivation is key. So, uh, you know, we like to start start the day with with, with a little bit of energy We're uh, we're all in, you know, working in, in, a, in an open environment together. So, you know, so so the deal is, is whoever arrives first to the office gets to pick the morning wake up song um, and no judgment allowed. Right. Love that. And so, you know, we crank up the tunes for uh, for a couple of minutes, get our get our blood going and, uh, you know, and, and start the day. Um, you know, otherwise, uh, really just on a day to day basis, uh, making both the prospecting calls and the follow up mm -hmm. calls and, you know, and, and working on a CRM daily is uh, is is sounds basic, but it's it's an important practice on a, on a daily basis. I love that. Early bird gets the worm and gets to pick the wake up song. Exactly. <laughs> I made my team do jump squats in our morning meeting the other day. So I was like, let's nice. wake up. Let's do all of it. Nice. Um, but the whole thing was about doing one more. So I made them do 10 jump squats. And I said, you guys got to do one more. So if you're planning out your day, as you're saying, doing your cold calls and you're prospecting and you're saying, I'm going to make 25 phone calls or this or that. It was always the prospect of do one more. So I was starting to say, 
this. I made them do 10 jump squats, and I'm happy to say everyone did 11. So I think I got that, I got that memo to them. I feel like I feel like you might have read Atomic Habits by James Clear. I have. I have. Is read that where Atomic. you got that from? I actually like got the, it. Just the extra one percent. Just the one extra thing. So I I have read Atomic Habits. Another book that I love is The Power of One More and his podcast by Ed Milet. Um, it's wonderful, but it's all about the habits that you do, the rituals, daily morning, and then just pushing yourself to do one more, making yourself that much better. Mm. Absolutely. So I'm on I'm on James Clear's email list. Love so it. every Thursday I get his, you know, his his inspirational quotes or whatever yep. and I forward it to our team as as Thursday inspiration and that's that's become a weekly little mini ritual, I guess you could say. That's beautiful. I love to hear it. Perfect. So diving into our second topic of the day, um, moving on to commercial real estate now. I'd love to know more about your work at Best and Partners and the success that you've created with your team there. So for context for some of our listeners that might not know, what is Best and Partners and what sets it apart from other brokerage firms? Sure. Um, so Besson Partners is really a middle market investment sales brokerage it, brokerage firm that uh, that does offer several other service lines. Um, the company was founded in 1988 in New York City by Michael Besson, who remains the chairman and CEO. Um, and we have transacted on sales ranging from one million to three hundred million uh, at the high end of the range. And what we've sold the most of has tended to be multifamily, mixed use properties, uh, also development sites, uh, some retail properties, and uh, and hotels. Uh, we had previously sold, uh, you know, a, a handful of hotels. And um, in recent times, we actually diversified a little bit to uh, to add a hotel advisory group, um, which coming out of the pandemic is now is now really uh, really gaining some some wonderful momentum. Um, the uh, you know we we've we've typically been New York City centric, and sure. in recent times we have just we have expanded our geographic reach a bit out of our New York City office. We've sold some properties in in Texas, Virginia, um, Connecticut, and New Jersey, and uh, you know we've we've you know we've expanded a bit in in that regard. Um, and also, we, uh, we, we do have a very competent property management division called New York City Management, mm -hmm. which oversees about 2,500 residential units in New York City. Uh, and within that division, there's also a distressed asset advisory group, which manages properties uh, in the foreclosure process for lenders and receivers. So, you know, I would say that that's a differentiator sure. uh, for us versus other investment sales firms of, of our size. Um, we really do have some, some, some in-house expertise that we can pull from. Mm -hmm. And as well, we, have, uh, we do actually have in-house counsel, which, uh, which does come in handy mm -hmm. uh, from time to time <laughs> in, uh, in, this, in this tough business that, uh, that we're in. So, uh, I, you know, I would say that, that we have some resources and, uh, you know, and tacit knowledge that, uh, mm -hmm. that, that other shops our size don't have. For sure. Absolutely. Thanks for that overview and definitely a lot of differentiators there. So thanks for sharing. I'd love to dive into how you built your team and established your track record for excellence. So from a branding and philosophy perspective, how do you differentiate yourself and your team and how do you provide the most value to your clients? Mm -hmm. So I'd start off by saying it's, it's really one, one person at a time. Uh, you know, we're, we're a boutique shop, uh, you know, and so every, every desk and every person matters. Mm -hmm. So, you know, now more than ever, we have become more selective about who, who we bring on board. Sure. Um, you know, and I would say that we really differentiate ourselves on a high level of service and, and engagement. Uh, you know, when when you hire us, we are really going to dig in and focus on uh, on your situation, and you know, and 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 working towards a su successful outcome. Um, you know, 
we've heard horror stories of people who hire brokers and then never hear from them. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and, and that's not how we operate. Mm -hmm. uh, we really want to uh, achieve our clients objectives at, at the at the center of everything. And, you know, we, we stay the course to ensure that uh, we do the best possible job that, that we can. I love that. So what I'm hearing too, just from the training aspect, being very specific about that, obviously you're hiring and mentoring and things like that. You only have so much time that you can spread across so many different people. So making sure that you're hiring the right type of candidate for the brokerage position, and then also so that you can service that to your clients, right? Making sure that the broker is then understanding the client and doing their due diligence and really understanding the pain, the problem of their situation, and then helping them to the best of their ability. So I love that. Absolutely, Ron. Great, great um, ethics to, um, to, build, to build the brand on. So as a broker and a team leader, how do you balance both, of this, both sides of that equation, right? I'm sure it's difficult from a time management perspective, learning how to delegate. Any strategies that you can share to our listeners about that? That's a good question. I, I, I am effectively a player coach mm -hmm. in my role, sure. uh, so I, I am highly sensitive to ensuring that uh, I'm never competing with mm -hmm. with any anyone on my team. If anything, I you know I do everything I can to to help people along and put them on on my listings and have them work with me when when those opportunities present themselves. Sure. Um, you know, and it really just, it does come down to time management and, and, and effectively knowing when to focus on what, mm. right? Um, so, you know, revenue generating activity is always the first order of business, right. naturally. And, uh, you know, that, that is certainly the focus and objective that, uh, you know, I'm, I'm working towards helping everyone on my team achieve. I love that point. The first one, you know, obviously being a player coach is probably difficult. And, you know, sometimes from the management perspective, you can say, hey, make more calls, do this, do that. But I love embodying, you know, I work for you, we work together type of scenario. So especially when you have to manage your own book and, and your own listings and things, plus help everyone out. So I love that you're talking about that aspect of it. So Ron, balancing both sides, obviously pretty difficult. How do you specifically come up with strategies or what works for you on time management or learning how to delegate or anything there? Hmm. Well, everybody's, everybody's important, right? Mm -hmm. Clients first, uh, team, team also first, <laughs> right? Yep. And everybody's issue is, is equally important. Mm -hmm. Right, so uh, it's 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 never easy, uh, you know. After I guess after some time and experience in the role, you you, know, you you just develop a little sense of you know of what to prioritize on. Sure. And you know, usually my my filter is clients. Clients come first. Um, you know that that said, then you get into things like just you know with 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 brokerage like all we have is our time, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and our success is large, our, 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 our earnings are largely success based, sure. right? So we have to be judicious about how we use our time. Um, you know, so, so really the first thing that uh, we, we frequently talk about is, is seller motivation. Do we have a real seller? Because that is first and foremost question number one and you know, if, if an answer is is not a resounding yes, then nothing else really matters at the end of the mm -hmm. day, right? I don't care if it's a million dollar transaction or a hundred million dollar transaction. Uh, you know, we don't get paid uh, if it doesn't close. Almost doesn't count. Mm -hmm. So that's that's critical. And guess what? It's not always readily apparent either. Yep. Uh, you know, sometimes people will sign an exclusive agreement, hire us, we go through the motions. And they're still not a real seller, mm -hmm. um, you know. So that's 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 pretty amazing, um, you know. And then 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 we talk about clients and you know and communication with clients, right? And it's sort of you know knowing when to when to be on them and knowing when to leave them alone, mm -hmm. right? So you know, there's certain times you gotta you gotta push push push. And other times you gotta hang back a little bit sure. and let let things progress. Uh, and you know, certainly, last but not least, I mean, generally speaking, I just 
pick my spots of where I can be of most value. Um, you know, an example of that is sometimes I'll say to, you know, to newer brokers, you know, if, if, if possible, take me on the second meeting mm. versus the first meeting, because more often than not, the first meeting with a prospect can be hit or miss. Mm -hmm. But the second meeting is usually a little more qualified, and that's where I can certainly add more value sure. uh, in, in securing the, the assignment with, yep. with a team member. Yep, absolutely. I think right there you hit the nail on the head is just picking where you can be of most valuable um, or of most value and then making sure you're doing that with the team as well as with the client and understanding what is going to transact, what is going to be the most helpful, and then knowing your strengths. And then if it's not something there, you know, maybe handing it off to someone else at that point. So I, I love that, Ron. Thank you for sharing. Um, in terms of how you built your team, how do you make sure each new addition to the team that you bring on embraces the best in partners culture? Yeah, so that's that's important. Mm -hmm. I, I, I place a high value on, on culture, mm -hmm. right? Because we spend a lot of our time and waking hours there, and I want it to be uh, fun, collegial, and professional, mm -hmm. and client-focused. So, you know, I, I spend a, a, lot amount, a lot of time with individual team members uh, going through pipeline and, and um, diagnosing issues and problem solving. And, uh, you know, I spend, we spend time together as a group, too, to, to build some cohesion amongst the team. Uh, you know, we try to get out and do fun things together. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the a recent event, we we took took the group up to uh, to the edge in Hudson Yards mm. uh, for an evening, and then had some some tapas at Little Spain for uh, for dinner afterwards, which was which was a lovely time. And so, you know, we we do try to take time to to, to do those sorts of things, uh, and just otherwise, I I really do try to lead by example mm. uh, with with particularly with the newer brokers, just specifically in terms of how I uh, communicate with clients and, uh, you know, and, and, and run a process. Sure. I, I think that you mentioned two really important things. The first one, just making sure to have fun with your team and kind of genuinely like each other. I got a tip and um, it was before you start to join a company, will you go out outside of work with this team and with these people? Right. One of my mentors said there's three things that you have to look at when joining a company. First is team, second is team, and third is product, mm. right? So team is hugely important. So it's really, really um, vital, especially in this industry where there's so many ups and downs and you are working hard. Just remember to celebrate those small wins and have fun and things like that. So totally. Celebrate, couldn't be more true. Celebrate success and, and learn from mistakes. I mm -hmm. mean, you know, there's a lot of there's a lot of landmines and pitfalls. I don't get I don't get upset with anybody if, if they make mistakes unless they're disrespectful to a client. That's mm -hmm. that's that's a line that uh, that we, we we don't cross. But sure. you know, but otherwise, I mean, you know, it's all chalk it all up to learning, and there's no dumb questions. Yes. And my door is open, and I'm here to help you. Um, and you know, to your point, uh, you know, sometimes I will th at least think to myself. Is this someone that I'd want to have a beer with? Right, right, right. Absolutely. And if not, I mean, we're in sales, right? Mm -hmm. People, people have to like you. Yeah, right. right. <laughs> like, likability is, you know, is 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 something you can't teach people. <laughs> I was just thinking that as so, you said it. Took the words right out of my mouth. So that's 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 important. It, it really is. And then the second point that you were saying is, you know, with clients and process and making sure that you do that. So transitioning into my next question is how do you train new brokers and continue to develop the team? Do you have processes in place? And you mentioned pipeline and making sure that you're sitting down with them one-on-one. -on -one. So talk to us a little bit about that. Sure. So we developed a training program uh, modestly called BEST, <laughs> which is short for Broker Excellence Standards Training. Amazing. Uh, and, you know, as a company that has been in business over 30 plus years, uh, you know, there's a lot of tacit knowledge and a lot of training materials that we have 
developed and grown over over the course of time to you know to the extent where you know we have enough training presentations to give one every single week of the year mm -hmm. so we have a pretty extensive training library on a, on a vast range of topics brokerage fundamentals real estate specifics and you know and what have you um, you know, so look, I mean, we're not a, you know, a, a corporate behemoth. We don't have people in, you know, informal training for three months per se. Um, and, you know, and after a while I find people's eyes tend to glaze over anyway. And sure. it's like how much, you know, how much <laughs> stuff can you jam into someone's right, head? Right, right. So typically, you know, it, it looks like a, like a two week kind of onboarding and basic training period mm -hmm. when new brokers come, come to our shop where we cover like all the fundamentals. And you know, and certainly we go through some uh, you know some some mock scenarios of of calls and pitches mm -hmm. and discussions to prepare for those things, and uh, you know, and then then the training wheels come off, mm -hmm. and you know, and people start prospecting, and you know, and then from there, there's you know, there's ongoing like weekly training topics and guest speakers we bring in to provide expertise on various topics and then really just you know just the day-to-day -day coaching and mentoring and you know and guidance and uh, you know and, and I'm very hands-on with people uh, you know my attitude is in, in in some ways I you know I, I work for you guys so mm -hmm. you know deploy me to help when when you need me right. so I do hop on calls with clients or prospects sometimes I do go on meetings to help pitch and secure business and then help execute along along the way uh, and you know frankly that's that's really how you learn in this business is by doing it yep I was just thinking that so um, I had been recently looking into adult learning strategies and what's the best way to you know have people learn a new skill especially as an adult right we're not in the classroom and I think it was a very different learning style right most people learn by doing I think that you know 70% was learning by actually doing and getting right in there 20% I think was learning by others so maybe seeing other colleagues success or maybe their pitfalls and kind of learning what to do or what not to do and 10% was in that classroom training so I love that you guys are doing more of a shorter kind of in-classroom training and then getting them out on the floor and kind of doing it with you and then also you know just getting their feet wet and kind of jumping right in and allowing them to do that so that's awesome of a process I like the best model <laughs> So transitioning to our third topic, Ron, um, we're going to zoom out a little bit more broadly. I'd love to ask some overview questions of your thoughts on the current state of the market. So what is your 37,000 feet overview of the current market happenings? What shifts are most worthy of our attention and what is just fluff? So... Um uh, just for perspective, I mean, I'll speak on market dynamics here in New York City because sure. that's where I'm based. Uh, sure. You might have a national audience, but um, so it, it's it's admittedly a challenging time for for commercial real estate mm -hmm. uh, overall, and New York City does have its own unique set of set of challenges. Um, you know, just big picture, uh, New York City. Commercial property sales uh, in the, in the first half of 2023, uh, from a dollar volume standpoint, uh, was about six billion. And for perspective, compared to the first half of 2022, it was about 12 billion. So it's down 50 percent for the first half of of this year, and uh, that is arguably largely due to uh, the interest rate environment mm -hmm. uh, that 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 we're living in. Um, you know that's that's big picture. Uh, not to be not to be negative, but we are living in the aftermath of what have some referred to as three black swan events, right? So number one, uh, you know, from a New York City standpoint, was the HSTPA uh, legislation in 2019 that really limited. Uh, ability to, to raise rents on on rent stabilized apartments mm -hmm. in, in New York City, which which there are, I, I believe like nine hundred thousand or so mm -hmm. in total. Uh, that was a game changer for uh, for for commercial property sales in in New York City. Um, the second, obviously, was a global pandemic. Mm -hmm. um, you know, who could have predicted that? <laughs> Answer: Bill Gates. But I don't know about anybody else. <laughs> okay. Um, 
And the third, uh, as I just alluded to, was just 11 consecutive interest rate hikes mm -hmm. sure. uh, that, you know, that have effectively doubled uh, cost of capital in the mm -hmm. past 18, 18 months or so. Right. Um, so, you know, people's heads are spinning and they're really, you know, don't know whether to hold them or to fold them, mm -hmm. so to speak. Um, you know, we, we did see a little bit of an uptick uh, this year in commercial sales in New York City going from the first quarter to the second quarter, which is somewhat encouraging. Uh, but, you know, if you annualize it, it, it looks like we're, you know, we're on track to, to, to hit somewhere between 10 and 12 billion dollars of, of total sales in New York City this year uh, which which would be would be down from from 2022 so you know it's it's a little tough right now mm -hmm. absolutely so what what are your thoughts on specific asset classes so given the diversity of the segments that ba that Besson works in what are specific um, <clears throat> asset classes? What are your thoughts? Any doing better or worse than one another? Give us a little bit of insight there. Sure. So this is a this is a it's a, it's a big answer. Yep. Yep. Uh, <laughs> Give us all the goods. <laughs> all right. So we'll start with we'll start with multifamily, which okay. is which is you know from quantitatively the the largest. Uh, stock of building inventory in New York City, mm -hmm. and you know historically what our company Besson Partners has sold the most of, right? Um, as a direct result of HSTPA, um, there's been measurable capital flight out of out of New York City, mm -hmm. uh, you know, into in, into multifamily in you know in in other places around the country. Uh, particularly the Sun Belt and lower regulation states like Texas and Florida, mm -hmm. where the tables turned and you know at one point uh, cap rates were were as low as three to four in 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 those places, uh, which is always what what it was in in New York City, mm -hmm. right? Um, so you know traditional New York City multifamily investors who, you know, who are always very New York City centric have broadened their acquisition criteria, sure. uh, both geographically and, you know, and by asset type. Um, you know, so that's, that's been a bit of a sea change in, you know, in the marketplace in, you know, in, in the past number of years. Um, you know, what, what is selling the most in, in recent times has tended to be smaller buildings uh, that, you know, meaning fewer than six units that fly under the radar of rent stabilization to, you know, to avoid that, uh, you know, and, um, you know, particularly in places like, like North Brooklyn, uh, where there's a lot of value add investors who are able to take under market, free market rents and bump them up a good 30% and, you know, and execute that business plan. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, that, that's, that has been what has been in highest demand in, in recent times. Um, talk industrial for a second, mm -hmm. right? So, um, admittedly, not, not really my core competency. However, just if we're talking about asset classes, industrial has arguably been the hottest asset class. Uh, yep. for the past five to eight years mm -hmm. and is just now sh showing some signs of, of cooling off. Mm -hmm. uh, there's some sub segments in there that have, you know, really been high growth, um, like, you know, last mile logistics, self storage, mm -hmm. um, iOS, uh, industrial outdoor storage, yep. covered land play. Um, so, you know, so that's been interesting. And uh, just as a side note, uh, we actually sold the largest industrial property uh, Besson has 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 done in the spring of this year, which uh, which was a, a seven hundred twenty five thousand square foot multi tenanted property in Patterson, New Jersey, for sixty five and a half million dollars. That's awesome. Yeah, that was uh, that was a nice one. Um, office, wah wah. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
Office is, you know, is really highest on the radar now, just in terms of, uh, you know, uh, challenges, right? Um, the current vacancy rate in, in office in New York City is 17%, mm -hmm. which equates to about 75 million square feet of empty offices, which is the equivalent of filling 16 Empire State buildings, just for perspective. Um, I am personally not a, not a big fan of, of working from home, uh, although there clearly is a, a paradigm shift uh, where, you know, where that is likely here to stay, uh, or certainly at least hybrid models, which mm -hmm. are forcing employers to reduce their, their footprints and cut back on office space. Um, so, you know, unfortunately, this, this sector is, is probably going to be challenged for the foreseeable future. Um, but look, that said, uh, just this morning I read about a, a trade in New York City of a 113,000 square foot Class B office building on West 32nd Street, uh, K-Town, to a Korean purchaser, actually, for $37 million, which I believe worked out to $370 per square foot, delivered vacant. So, you know, I mean, it's, it's certainly not dead. Uh, right. You know, New York City will 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 keep going, mm -hmm. but uh, but 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 office is is, is tough right now. Um, talk about hotel mm -hmm. for a second. Uh, hotel is back from the dead from the pandemic. It was arguably the the hardest hit sector there. I mean, everyone stayed home, mm -hmm. nobody traveled, so yep. <laughs> hotels really felt it. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, and um, you know. Hotels, arguably, are the Cinderella story of the moment. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, travel and tourism is, is up, and yep. occupancies thus far this year in New York City is up to 87%. Mm -hmm. Room revenues have increased. Uh, you know, and as well, you, we now have this, this interesting dynamic of the city renting out thousands of rooms to house uh, asylum seekers. Mm -hmm. So, you know, the, the, all the migrants coming to New York, cu coupled with, you know, a homelessness issue, has, um, has in recent times been a bit of a boon for the, for the hotel industry. Um, so, you know, one interesting kind of yin and yang, yin, yin and yang dynamic that we're finding is just is, is valuation is a little tricky right now because hotel clients are saying to us, well, look, my, my room revenues are, are, are higher than even 2019. Um, therefore, my property is worth more. <laughs> but you got interest rates at 7 to 8%. Mm -hmm. So, you know, that is an opposing force putting downward pressure on pricing. Sure. So it gets a little hard to reconcile valuation in that, uh, in that discussion. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much for that overview. That was so insightful. I learned a ton. Um, I would definitely agree. It was very hard for me even to find a hotel here in New York City. Everything was booked up. Expensive and, too, right? Very expensive. Yeah. I mean, every airport that I go to, everyone is bustling. There was a ton of people. So that is definitely back up, I will say. Um, what are some of maybe your controversial thoughts or surprising thoughts about the current market happenings that you'd like to share? I know we don't have a crystal ball, but anything controversial or surprising on the current market in your perspective? Yeah. Well, um, good segue question because, you know, I was kind of struggling to think about an answer to this and then, and then it hit me, which is that, you know, there is a, there is a faction of, of New Yorkers who are tickled pink about the, you know, the, the, the migrant crisis. And I know that that sounds weird and, you know, and, and terrible. Uh, these are, these are human beings. And, uh, you know, of, of course, as New Yorkers, we, we want to help people. Um, but just from a real estate standpoint, as I alluded to before, owners and operators of economy and limited service mm -hmm. hotels are making money hand over fist right now. Um, housing, you know, housing, housing migrants coming coming into New York City, and you know, if you think about it, uh, you know, you have a hotel with with 150 rooms uh, at a you know at a contracted rate of $110 per bed per per night per person uh, with 100% occupancy guarantee. 
do the math, that adds up to millions of dollars. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. a lot of these owners have actually recouped their losses from the pandemic and then some. Mm -hmm. So uh, that might be a quasi controversial thing to say, but it is fact. And um, it is an interesting uh, dynamic post post pandemic that uh, is worth noting. Absolutely. No, I think that's great. So another thing based on what you said, and, and this is just kind of a, a thrown in, in the wind question, but some of the office buildings, I've been seeing some people that are purchasing them and then getting creative with repurposing them into either some multifamilies or potentially even do you think it would be like a hotel? What are your thoughts on that? Is that a possibility for some buyers <clears throat> or anything that you've suggested or kind of seen? Ashley, we're going off script now, but, I can, but, I, can, <laughs> but I can take the question. I can do it. <laughs> um, so, you know, the, the, answer is, the answer is yes, that, that is something that has certainly um, been discussed frequently. Uh, adaptive reuse and, mm -hmm. uh, you know, conversions from, from hotel to, to, to largely residential because, sure. you know, we have a supply constraint in residential and, mm -hmm. and certainly in affordable housing in, in New York City. And, you know, there, there are a few uh, noteworthy projects that, you know, that are occurring, uh, you know, one, one downtown, I believe, on, on, Maiden, on Maiden Lane, uh, you know, of some size and scale. But, you know, the, the practical reality is, is that it's a heavy lift. Sure. Um, you know, and the, the asset and the structure do have to lend itself to, to doing that. And, you know, oftentimes, uh, you know, if you have a mid-block building or perhaps a block-through building, it is hard to do that from a light and air standpoint because, okay. you know, you only have light and air mm -hmm. on two sides. Yep. And particularly if you have a very deep building, it, it, can, get, it can get dark and it doesn't mm -hmm. lend itself too, too well to that. Sure. Um, so, but, you know, certainly, uh, you know, pe people are tuned into that and, and looking for those opportunities. Uh, but, you know, the, the cost basis has to, you know, ha has to work in that, in that equation as well. Sure. Based on your expertise, I had to ask when we were going over the, the office overview. So thank you for answering that question. It was on top of my mind and I'm sure it would be for our listeners as well. So thanks, Ron. Um, going after, you know, kind of shifting into our second question on this topic. Um, how are some of these assets <laughs> that you've spoken about being affected by current macroeconomic factors. I know we were discussing inflation and rising, rising interest rates, higher insurance costs. What is being affected the most and how, how so? Uh, well, I mean, right now, I think what is top of everyone's mind is, is interest rates, Yep. right? Um, and the answer is that each and every one of those factors that you described is putting downward pressure on pricing. Mm -hmm. um, you know, plain, plain and simple. Um, inflation is uh, is easing up, and um, it seems like talks of uh, of an impending recession are, are dwindling. Thankfully, mm -hmm. um, you know, interest rates are now in and around seven percent, give or take. And so, uh, you know, they've they've more than doubled in the past eighteen months. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, you, you and I are, are, are thankfully both too young to, you know, to talk about the 80s, really, where interest rates were in the teens. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, we've been spoiled by, sure. uh, you know, historically low interest rate environment, as mm -hmm. in most people, you know, in the, in the industry in this day and age. Right. Uh, but, um, you know, that, that's a big factor. I'm, you know, I'm also hearing from clients that insurance premiums have skyrocketed mm -hmm. to two to three times. And, you know, and that that cuts into net operating income, which subsequently right. hurts valuations, right? right? So, um, so consequently, I mean, we are, we are seeing properties trade in a seven cap range in, in New York City now. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, th that would be buildings that are predominantly rent stabilized mm -hmm. assets. Uh, or also perhaps retail commercial properties in the boroughs uh, with non-credit tenants. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Thanks for that overview. So if you were to give our listeners kind of your short-term and long-term outlook for the New York City market, what would it be and why do you think that? So my, my short-term outlook is that sales will be 
flat to marginally increased in the next sec six to 12 months, right? I mean, we, maybe we end up at 10 to 12 billion uh, in, in aggregate dollar volume in sales in New York City for commercial property in 2023. Uh, I would love to predict a 20 to 30 percent increase in that mm -hmm. in that volume in 2024. Sure. However, uh, bear in mind that it's going to be an election year, mm -hmm. and that breeds uncertainty. Mm -hmm. And when there's uncertainty, people tend to hold steady and not do anything. So um, you know that that's a, that's a key consideration. Uh, you know one one thing that really does need to, to change here somehow, some way, is there needs to be some loosening of, of, of regulations uh, in, in New York City. And, you know, and, and obviously I'm, I'm, I'm alluding to rent regulations, mm -hmm. uh, you know, and, and other uh, tax incentives to, to build more sorely needed housing. Um, you know, un unfortunately, uh, I guess to, 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 to state a cliche, the road to hell is paved with good intentions. And uh, the enactment of these rent regulations, uh, you know, have, have resulted in, in something counterintuitive, which is, uh, you know, more housing taken out of supply. Because unfortunately, um, you know, the, the profit potential is taken out of the equation for a landlord where they're disincentivized to invest into property improvements to raise rents. So there's 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 negative return mm -hmm. on their capital, um, so that that that's creating a really challenging dynamic here in New York City, mm -hmm. and it's also uh, driving defaults and insolvency mm -hmm. uh, amongst amongst landlords, which is frankly creating a precarious situation here. Sure, absolutely, and you kind of alluded to you know this next question. But as we are heading into 2024, what, in addition to election year and things that needed to be changed in terms of regulations, what are some primary concerns or considerations when you're advising clients through the current economic times? Mm -hmm. So long-term upsides, current obstacles. I know we kind <clears throat> of touched on some of these, but go a little bit deeper for us. Um, I will, but but if I may, um, just. I, I do want to add a little uh, addendum to, to my last point, sure. just about the the outlook, uh, and and that is to say, uh, you know, as 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 far as New York City goes, uh, I'm I'm certainly bullish long term mm -hmm. for the city. Um, obviously, we have some serious challenges and headwinds that we're we're, we're dealing with at present, uh, but New York City is uh, has always been incredibly resilient. Yep. Um, it is uh, it is a wonderful ecosystem here, and uh, people from around the world come here for you know for for, for a lot of reasons. Yep. Um, so you know I, I think long term there's there's always going to be capital appreciation. So I, I do want to say that as a you know as a proud native New Yorker as well. <laughs> Absolutely, so, you know. um, I no longer live in New York City, but I have for five years, and now. I'm an LA native. Um, don't hold that against me either. But 70 and uh, <laughs> sunny. I, I hear you. But at the same time, it's New York or nowhere for me. So I, yeah. I completely agree with that. New York is one of the most resilient cities, and it definitely will, you know, go through its challenges, but come out on the other side. Absolutely, yeah. one way or another. Yeah. So I mean, so your next question had a few had a few facets to it. Sure. I guess one is you know first to just give you a, like a philosophical answer of like you know guiding how to guide or advise clients in, sure. in, a, in, a, in through murky waters, right? Yep. Um, and and to, to give you a philosophical answer to that, <laughs> uh, you know my 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 attitude is is always you can you can lead the horse to water, but you can't make it drink, Sure. right? So, you know, it is a challenging time that's mm -hmm. creating uncertainty. Um, and to me, the primary, my primary consideration is always like, what are, you know, what are my clients' objectives and how can we be instrumental in achieving those? Yep. And, um, you know, sometimes, sometimes the answer is just standing down and doing nothing. Um, and, you know, we have to respect that. Uh, you know, long-term upside, uh, you know, I think is is something that 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 you've inquired about, and you know, and and that that really comes down to to basis and and buying right. Mm -hmm. Period. No matter mm -hmm. where you're you're buying or what what asset you're buying, um, you know, then 
We're going to talk about current obstacles, and the list is long, right? <laughs> um, there's, there's, there's interest rates. There's mm-hmm. onerous legislation in place. Um, there's properties underwater with, with their debt. There's a, you know, there's a disconnect on pricing, which is just creating a general malaise in the market. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, with all that said, there's always smart money out there that finds right. opportunities to, you know, to, to generate returns. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, who knows? Maybe we'll see funds emerge that buy thousands of rent stabilized units at a hundred thousand dollar a door basis and double their money in a you know in a five year holding period, or maybe there will be a, you know a contrarian office fund who uh, you know who buys who buys in at. 250 bucks a foot under replacement cro- costs and, uh, you know, and, and is patient capital and uh, banks on the fact that, not the fact, but the opinion that, uh, you know, maybe people get sick and tired of working from home in their sweatpants and want to go into an <laughs> office more frequently. Sure. So time will tell. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. And that was a lot of good advice, a lot of good predictions and kind of thoughts there. Do you have any general advice for players in this space? Yes, I do. Uh, And I'll try to speak in bullet points here. Okay. Thank you. Um, One, focus on what is in the realm of your control. Mm -hmm. All right. And speaking in broad brushstrokes here, that could apply Mm -hmm. to a lot of different market participants. For sure. Um, Get used to interest rates. Mm-hmm. They're gonna stay where they are yep. for for a while, or give or take. Mm-hmm. Um, underwrite conservatively, yep. right? Um, if you're not realistic on pricing expectations, you're probably not gonna sell. Sure. Right now, and um, last and probably most importantly, relationships are everything. Yes. So you know, if if it's you're a broker, you're a principal, you're an attorney, you're an accountant, uh, a service provider, uh, relationships matter. Absolutely! Wow, such good advice, Ron. I appreciate all of that, and I'm sure our listeners do as well. Um, fourth topic. So we are going to go into some rapid fire questions. So given your specialized background and expertise, our listeners definitely want to know this. So first and foremost, if you were given $50 million today and had to invest it immediately, what would your go-to asset type and location be and why? Let's see. Um, can I, can I say Oceanfront in Bridgehampton. <laughs> Same. <laughs> uh, <laughs> or Malibu in your case, right? Um, uh, you know, half half kidding aside, because um, you're asking about investment properties, right? Um, I would, you know, I, I would. But, and by the way, this is an inherently biased question because, of course, like, you know, the broker that you're asking is going to say, well, you know what I'm selling. Right. Uh, but, of course. but I'm, I'm going to try not to do that and give you an honest answer. And in. You know, I, I, I would try to spread it across a few things. Sure. Um, starting with, I would, you know, I would probably acquire several uh, all free market, mm-hmm. multifamily or mixed use okay. buildings yep. in prime Manhattan and uh, and North North Brooklyn, um, preferably tax class 2A or 2B okay. to put a ceiling on the, the amount of tax increases you could get there. Um, secondly, I don't know, I might might buy a little boutique hotel in the Miami area, mm. uh, you know, or an emerging city in, in Florida. Uh, and last, the, but not least, and frankly, I, you know, the, the, the un, unsung hero of, uh, of, of commercial real estate, I would probably pick up a couple of uh, triple net lease type, type assets mm-hmm. with uh, credit rated tenants and corporate sure. guarantees just for a nice safe return to sleep at night and not have to do anything. There you go. Now we have our plan for success. <laughs> Someone give us sounds about good, 50 right? million, please. <laughs> yeah, it sounds sound great. Good? It sounds great. Or screw it all, just ocean, <laughs> ocean front and Bridgehampton. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> Second question. What is your favorite tool or software that you use on the job? And I promise this is not a trick question. You don't have to say Crexy. Mm. <laughs> do we think that's a biased question there? Just a little bit? Um, well, besides Crexy, which obviously we do use, otherwise I wouldn't be sitting here, right? Sure. <laughs> um, I, I would I would say uh, 
we have a CRM solution called sure. Zoho okay. that I absolutely love and I'm a, a big fan of. And uh, you know, big believer in, in, in CRMs. You got to stay organized. Yep. Uh, is you know is critical. And uh, we've cycled through several of them through the course of time at Besson, and this is by and far my my favorite. Very user friendly. Uh, it has a suite of of apps to use, apps for your phone, mm -hmm. um, and uh, I, I like it a lot. Absolutely. I mean, can't tell you, you, you said it multiple times, relationships in this industry are key in life, everything like that, and helping, you know, you stay organized, keeping all of your contacts in one place, um, definitely hugely beneficial. Um, and then third rapid fire question, last but certainly, certainly not least, what is the most common misconception about your job or your industry? That's easy. Um, People think brokerage is is easy money, you know. Just like sign sign up and you know, and we just put it out there. Mm -hmm. Maybe throw a sign on the building or whatever, and you know, <laughs> and it sells itself. Sure. And a uh, piece of cake, mm -hmm. right? And you know, and why why do why do these people, uh, you know, get make so much money and get get handed such big checks? And uh, <laughs> you know, sorry to say, the, the 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 reality is that there's a heck of a lot of dead deals uh, and, you know, and, and, and disappointment mm -hmm. and sweat equity yep. along the way to get to one of those nice commission checks. For sure. There's a lot of blood, sweat and tears in commercial real estate and a lot of things that you don't see behind the scenes, which is why to our points in the beginning, building that culture and building those mentors and building the team and the training and the people that you surround yourself that, you know, will get you out of those tough times and help you is really, really important. So having a company culture like Best and Partners is awesome for those downtimes, right? Um, well, thank you so much. Last thing before we let you go, here for our listeners any parting words that you'd like to share with our audience sure uh, I will graciously take the opportunity to say to anyone who's actually listened to me uh, wax poetic here uh, if you liked what you heard today please consider hiring Besson partners to uh, to sell your commercial real estate uh, and or consider talking to me about joining our team Absolutely. I love it. I love it. Well, thank you, Ron, so much for joining us and sharing your insights. We know that you're super busy, so we genuinely appreciate the time for you to take sitting down with us here today. If our listeners want to get in touch, join the team, sell, list deals with you, how do we get in touch? Uh, very easy. Um, you know, you can look at our website, Best and Partners, where you'll find my contact information. Uh, certainly also look at our company LinkedIn page. And, uh, and we have an Instagram uh, feed as well that uh, shows our deals as well as gives you a little glimpse into our, our company culture. So. Amazing. Well, thank you all so much. Thanks, Ron, again for joining us. And thanks to everyone who tuned in today. If you enjoyed the episode, be sure not to miss the next one. Visit go.crexy.com slash podcast and sign up to get the next episode delivered straight to your inbox. Of course, you can also subscribe to the Crexy podcast on your favorite podcast app and check out our YouTube channel for video recordings of each episode. Take care and be sure to tune in next time.